Okay, uh, first question I had was, um, does anybody have any questions on what we've done so far with the magazine spread? Okay. I'm sorry, you're trying to what? Okay, well, one of the ways it would be to use your photos bigger. Like that, you can also use your headline bigger. Um, but if you want to add color, some more color, then you can take a uh, you can take a rectangle, for instance. This isn't a great solution. Um, you can go and use this tool, the eyedropper tool, and you can click on an image and it allows you to add colors to your color palette. If I go to window, uh, color swatches. You'll see I now have added what's called a colorful theme here, so I could add that. Um, I'd also get rid of the stroke that it puts around that by default. Um, switch that to none, then object. Uh, let's see. Object arrange send it back. So that might be a way. If I were to take this red color here and move it all the way to the bottom of the page like that. Um, one thing you're going to notice is that this text becomes really hard to read. So what I would do is I would take this and maybe add a color block behind it or a white block behind it, a light color or a white block or something like that. And then object arrange send backward. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to create some space around that text so that it's not bumping into the edge of that uh, white box. So it looks something like that. So. And I actually might want to make this a little bit less even. So, uh, does that help? Yeah, it does. Okay. Yes. I've been having trouble getting captions on pictures without, like, um, and being able to not have text going to it. Like, um, 
like if I put um, a caption below a picture, right? Um, the text draft doesn't seem to apply to that, so it just goes on top of right. Like, so what you would need to do is if you want to, so this right now, my caption is, has the text underneath over it, right? So I need to take the caption box and I need to also add a text wrap to that. So window text wrap there. And that pushes the text away. Um, the biggest problem is that if you text wrap an image, let's see if this is text wrapped. So that means it needs a text wrap. So say I take this image and I add a window, I, I add a text wrap to that image. And I'll give it a little bit more space around. Huh. Oh. Need to make sure that it's the image that you've selected. Text wrap. Give it a little bit more space around it. Now, the problem is that if you text wrap this picture, and then I take this caption and I put it in here, there's only so far you can only get within, in this case, six points because of the text wrap. So if I want this, you might actually want to write this down. If you have an object that you don't want to be affected by this text wrap, then you need to go to object text frame options. And then at the very bottom, there's this tiny little checkbox that says ignore text wrap. And if I click on the ignore text wrap, then I can put this caption as close to the image as I want. Oh, we can also do there instead of putting for every picture, put one. Right. You could if that's going to work better for your design. Okay. Other questions? So if you want your page to be more exciting, uh, what you need to do is increase the contrast. Um, oftentimes size contrast is going to be the easiest thing to do to make it look more exciting, like make a picture really big. In this case, my pictures are all kind of the same size, but if I delete this, delete that, and make this super big. So
So I think like that looks a little bit more exciting than what I had before. Just because the, you know, one of the images is, is blown up. And the I, and one of the things you would probably want to consider is, so which of the images that you're working with is the one that you like the best? If it's the one that you like the best, you might want to use that image larger. Um, you as a designer are allowed to have opinions about which image is the best and uh, then accent that image. You know, highlight that image. Okay, so then if I could have your attention for a couple of minutes, I want to talk about adding page numbers to something like this. Okay, so In the grand scheme of things, if you have a 120 page magazine and you want to put page numbers on the mag on the magazine, uh, which would be a good idea because there's so many pages, or if you have an annual report or something else that has a lot of pages and you want to add page numbers, well, you could type out each and every page number and place every page number on every page, right? So that'd take a lot of work, right? And then if somebody decided they wanted to switch some of the pages around, you've got to go through and make the page number changes. And then you're gonna to have to, and there's gonna to have to be a final check before you actually go to press just to make sure you get all the page numbers in the right place. So InDesign has built into it an auto page number function where we can place the page numbers um, on what's called a master page. And then on the master page, um, everything, um, it will automatically paste, place the page numbers and you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so if you go to your pages palette, you'll see at the top, there's something called a master. Oh, actually, so I'm, again, before I go into that, um, there is, and let me make sure that I'm recording, okay. So uh, at the bottom of your toolbar, there is a um, selection for sc the screen. You can go to normal view and it shows you your guides, which don't print. And then if you go to preview, then it turns off the guides. So normal. So I'm gonna go to normal view so I can see the guides. If I click on a master, okay. I'm gonna have to deal with, okay.
So there is a, actually, what I'm running up against is a bug in InDesign where sometimes if you go to the master, it does not show you the grid. So what I'm doing is I'm going to lay out margins and columns. I'm going, turning off preview, turning on preview, clicking OK. So this is what your master pages should look like. Um, the thing is, when you set up your initial page, when, in the, when you're going to new and you set up a page and you tell it to be three columns, these columns actually exist on this master page. And then this master page affects all the other pages in the document. So if I create some more pages from the master, you'll see that they automatically have these guides like that, okay? And if I were want, wanted to change the number of columns in my magazine overall, I could go and select these two pages in the pages palette, the two master pages in the pages palette, go to layout, go to margin and columns, set it down to two, for instance, click okay. And then if I go to the pages, you'll see that the guides have changed throughout the document like that. Go back to layout. Uh, let's see, go back to the master and select both those pages, layout, margins and columns, reset it back to three, click okay. And then it fixes it. You can also go to the master page. You could create a block like this, fill it with red. Go to your pages and you'll see that automatically it's on all these pages. If I go to my master and I move this block around, then it moves around on all the pages, okay? So the master affects any place in the document where the master has been used. Does that make sense? Okay, and then I can go and delete it and it gets deleted from all the pages. Now, one thing about this is that if you look at this, it actually, when you place something on the master page, it actually, so every time you place something in a document, it's on top of everything else. It's in sort of its own layer on top. Anything on the master page is down below anything that you actually place on the page. So I place this block on the master page. And so it's behind the photo, it's behind the text and so on. Okay. Go back to the master. And so you're thinking, so what is this, what difference does this actually make? Well, the difference is that we can actually add page numbers on the master page and then have them show up throughout the document and we don't have to paste it on every page. Okay, so to do that, we can create guides by clicking on the ruler and dragging a guide. 
And if you drag it on the page, it'll only extend across the page. But if you drag it across this pasteboard area outside of the page, then it will automatically um, cross all the way across the spread. Okay, so I've created a little guide there and I'm gonna create a guide on the outside and a guide on the outside there. Then I'm gonna take my text tool and I'm gonna drag a text box. And if I type the number one, and I go to my document, first of all, you don't see it there, but then you get one and you get one. So clearly that's not how we would add the page numbers. So what we wanna do is we wanna take, delete that. And if you go to type and you go down to insert special character, there are a bunch of different char special characters you can add, but what we want is a marker and we want the marker for the current page number. And I click and I get this letter A. And if I go to my document, I still can't see it here, but on page four, it's now says four. And on page six, it now says six. Okay. Does that make sense? Questions? Nope. Okay, I will keep going. Okay. Now, since you may have, well, let's see. I'm also going to go in. Yep. Yes, but if you paste a number on the master, then it's going to appear that number will appear on all the pages. You need a special character for it to give you the actual page number instead of whatever you've typed in there. Okay, so so I delete that and I go to type and I go to insert special character and I go to markers and current page number or command option shift N will also give you the current page number. And what it places there is a letter A. Um, that's because this is the A master. If this was uh, the B, if you made created another master page, it would be probably the B master, and then you'd get a B instead. Or if it was, uh, you know, you made another master page, then it would be a C. But it's it's, and you can't just type like the capital letter A and have that work. You need to actually go type, insert special characters, markers and the current page number. Okay, and I'm gonna take it down to align with my guide. Also, this is gonna come in at 12 points. So make it at most 10 points and maybe more like nine points because the page number is not as important as the text in your document. So you want it kind of small. And so I'm gonna move it down a little bit more. We also, on this page, we want it to be flush left because if this was like a hundred pages long, 
we want this to be able to expand out this way and still stay lined up here. Yes. I drew it with the with the pen with the type tool. And then from there you do the specific. Yeah. Okay. So you draw a text box and then you can insert special characters. So if we start it on page two, so it's having a number. Two. Um, so it's going to give you a page two, which is fine. Um, in a magazine, the left hand page is always going to be an even page, and the right hand page will always be an odd page. So for this, the first one should be two? Yeah. Do you have to drag a ruler down for every print? No, oh, you, do that you just do it on the master. And then it'll appear on all the pages, actually. So if you have a, a guide that you want to appear on all the pages, you can uh, draw it on the master page and then it'll automatically show up everywhere. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, Command Z undoes just like all the other programs. And so I thought I was on the master page, but it's not doing it all. It just seems like that. Okay, so again, we go to the master page by going to the pages palette and then double clicking. Double click on the master, and then I hold my shift key and that'll select the other page. Um, you can also go to layout pages. Um, sorry, that's not it. Let's see, go to page. Yeah, you could also go to layout, go to page. There's a drop down, and you could go to a master that way instead of the pages palette, but the pages palette is mostly how you get there. Just saying a parent, not a. All right. Okay, this is, um, okay, my version of InDesign, and I think the ones on the computers in here all say a master. I don't know why I'm assuming that it's some politically correct thing, but now they're calling it, I'm sorry, what are they calling it? Yeah. Yeah, a parent instead of a master. I, I don't know why they made that change, um, but that's what it's called now instead of master. So, um, however, a parent page and a master page are equivalent and in the same place. Okay, so I have my page number here or my, my master page number here and edit copy, edit paste in place. And I'm just gonna drag it, uh, come on. Hold my shift key and I can drag it all the way to the right. And then this one, I'm gonna go to my properties and align it to the right. So again, if there's 100 pages or 101 pages, that um, the page number will show up correctly. And then if you go to your pages, 
I'll go to my pages four and five, and four and five are here, six and seven, they say six and seven. Okay. Now I'm going to get a little bit more complicated because here I've got my background color. All right. And the background color is on this page, not on the master page. And so the background color, in fact, covers up my page number. And if I go to here and I scroll up, you'll see that there's my page number. I scroll down and it covers up my page number. So there's a little trick that you can do in order to have your page number show up on top of your, you know, your background color. And so what you can do, so there's something called the layers palette, window layers, which you may have run into in Photoshop or Illustrator. And so since on layer one, anything in the background layer is behind anything you place on the page, what we can do is we can actually create another layer. So the layer palette again is under windows. Uh, layers, turn it on. We create a new layer here or in the upper right, new layer. I double click on the name of it and change it to page numbers. Okay. And then I can select my page number here. And you'll see it shows up as a little blue marker on this layer one and I can drag it up to layer, the pages layer, page numbers layer. And you'll see that it's now highlighted in red down here. And I can click this page number, drag it up to page numbers. And now if I go here, you'll see that I can actually see my Page number. Let's see if I can zoom in. Okay. Preview like that. So it's a matter of placing the page number on its own layer up above your base page layer, and then it'll show up on top of any background or anything else you create on layer one of your InDesign file. Okay. All right. So does that make sense so far? Okay, one more thing. So magazines usually have the name of the publication and the date of the publication down at the bottom of the page. That way, if somebody rips a page out of the magazine at some point, um, they could still tell what publication it's from and when the date was. So what we would also do, is create another text box over here on the right. You can make up the name of your publication. Um, Again, I would make this not 12 point, but I'd make it more like nine point probably. 
I'd also probably make it say italic or something so that it's different from the body text. So people don't get confused about what it is. And in this case, we're gonna align it on the right. And then I'm gonna option shift drag this over here, align it to the left and make this, um, what is it? March, 2022. So so we have our page number, name of the publication, date, and then page number on the right. And if we go to page two, so there's page number in that and then the date. And if I go down to pages six and seven in my case, then six. And so it's on all the pages, continuous. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Any other questions? Otherwise, um, otherwise, I'll leave you to work for the rest of the class if you have. Uh, questions you can ask and I'd be happy to help. So. Okay, so all right. First thing I want to mention is that InDesign is weird in that every other program out there, I think has spell check turned on by default. There is a spell check in InDesign, it's turned off by default. So if you wanna turn on spell check, which I recommend that you do, um, you can go to InDesign, preferences, Preferences is under InDesign on the Mac and under, I think it's at the very bottom of the, the drop down for edit on a PC. But if you go to preferences, there is spelling. You go to spelling, you turn on enable dynamic spelling. And then so long as you are in normal view, anything that's misspelled or that it questions is uh, underlined in red, okay? Very useful to make sure that your headlines are all spelled correctly and so on. All right, um, so there's that. Let's see, I'm gonna just go to the next page create myself a nice big text box. Um, there is an option. I don't recommend it for what you're doing, but there is an option, uh, which is good if you don't quite know what you're doing, but you need something that looks like text to play with. If you go to type towards the bottom, it, there's something called filled with placeholder text. 
and you can fill your text boxes with what is called Greeking, which is actually uh, Latin, which is useful. Now, of course, in this case, since it's all in Latin, I would go to my preferences, go to spelling, and turn off enable dynamic spelling because otherwise everything's underlined in red. Okay, so say for instance, I was going to go to window, color, swatches. Say for instance, I wanted to make the background of this uh, yellow. Okay. Um, we don't want, it doesn't look good. It's not considered good. Um, unless you're doing a uh, new wave design or you're doing uh, grunge design, it generally does not look good to have your text right up to the edge of this color block. You generally want a margin around it, which will then make it look a little bit more refined, a little bit better. So I could make a text box that's yellow and then place a smaller text box um, that has the text in it, just has the text in it, and then I can move the text in. But there is another way. If you go to object, so this is something else you might wanna write down because it's not obvious. Um, if you go to object and you go to text frame options, which is command B, which is also a good keyboard command to remember because there are lots of functions hidden in this little text and text frame options. I turn this on. First of all, I can add columns within this text box. Oh, first of all, it's a good idea to turn on preview, but now I have to figure out why, uh, hang on a second. I have to actually select it. Always a good idea. Object, text frame options. I can change the number of columns within this text box like that. Then there is, and I can change the amount of space in between the columns. It looks like I can even change the width of this, of the columns um, there. And then there is something called inset spacing, which is going to create space around the outside. So if I click up, you can see that the text box, the text moves in away from the edge. And does that look better? Okay. There is also something called, let's see. Uh, I'm gonna click okay for a moment because I can't change the text box, but we also have something under here text frame options, where we can actually, instead of aligning this text on the top, we can tell it to align in the center or align on the bottom. You can also tell it to justify, and I'm curious to see, and it, what it does in fact is it spreads out the text. Uh, mostly I suggest not using this for justifying the text, um, but it does exist. This uh, vertical justification is particularly handy if we are working with a headline. On a yellow box, headline properties, 72. Say I've got a headline like that. If I want to center it, 
left and right and center it top and bottom. I can go to paragraph centering and, it will, and the headline will always be perfectly centered. And then I would go to object text frame options and tell it to align in the center like that. And now that headline is always going to be centered no matter how big or how small I might make the box. Um, finally, if I go to object text frame options, there is also, oh, right. I don't think I have that option on here. So on newer versions of InDesign, there is actually an option to add rules in between the columns if that's something that you like or want. And then it'll automatically add rules in between the columns and perfectly center them and so on. And that again would also be under text frame options. It's just not under the version that I have here. Okay. And so if I go to preview, so this now looks like this. If I want more space in here, I go to command B and I can make this like a two pica gutter. So it's bigger. And then maybe the inset spacing is set to two also. And if I make this text justified like that, and I also indent it. So, and that way you don't have several text boxes. Uh, you can do it all in one thing. There are some disadvantages sometimes to having only one single text box do all this work. Sometimes things need to be moved around. There's some things that happen automatically here that sometimes just don't work well with a single text box. But a lot of times um, using uh, text frame options will allow you to do a lot of work uh, rather quickly and then this whole thing just moves as a unit. You don't have to worry about uh, things wandering off, not selecting everything and so on. Um, so one other thing I'm going to mention, which is really rather a uh, power user tip. So this text here is justified. In other words, it lines up on the left and it lines up on the right. In order to line it up on the left and line it up on the right, by default, what InDesign does is it adds space between each word. Now, what happens is particularly if I make this narrower, is sometimes that spacing starts creating rivers. Um, because there's because of just the nature of words. Some words are longer, some words are shorter. If you have longer words, they're going to need bigger spaces in order to make it justified. Um, so So if I select all this text and I go to paragraph, uh, let's see. What I would want to do is instead of using this paragraph control over here, I'd want to go to window, uh, type in tables, and go to paragraph like that. And that gives you an actual window. Uh, when we go to the options for that window, there are a bunch of controls that are not available under the properties panel. 
And one of them is something called justification controls. And if I open that up, I can see that uh, word spacing is set to be a minimum of 80% and a maximum of 133% of the normal word spacing. But letter spacing is set to zero. Again, so what I'm talking about here is like superpower user kind of information. Most designers probably don't even know this exists. But I can take this and not only have word spacing, but also have letter spacing helping this justification. And if I set this to minus 5% and to 5%, and I turn on preview, you can see that here I have a bunch of rivers running through my text. You know, and it's not particularly smooth looking. But if I add this letter spacing, turn on preview, you can see that there's still some rivers running through this text, but it's just not as bad as it was. And so I click OK, and it looks like that. I hit Command Z. Command Z, Command Shift Z. So, <coughs> power user tip is if you're justifying, you should give it, let it do a little bit of letter spacing in addition to the word spacing, and your text will look smoother. Okay. And you can just forget all about that if you need, if you know, that's too much information, but it does exist. If you want to save your document to a PDF so that you can print it in the laser printer and back. Then what you would want to do, what I would have you do is go file. Hang on a second. File, Adobe PDF presets. Uh, I would save it as a press quality PDF. Click that. Um, it will automatically save in the folder while you, where you have your document. What I would do when you open up, it'll give you this dialog box and I would tell it to view PDF after exporting. Right here, click export. It's going to probably give, if you didn't use all of your article, it's probably going to say something like this, and you can safely ignore that in this case. If you were actually working on a real document, uh, you would not want to have it give you this warning. But for this project, we can, we can ignore that. And so then it gives me my document and a series of pages. And I could take this and print it. And um, range, in this case, one to two, and print.
Now the disadvantage of our laser printer is it prints a little light. I can't really do anything about that. And so I could look at this and see if the type looks too big or too small. Because that's the actual size of a printout. 